Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is truly wild in the way that it happened as well as the motive behind it. I will never cease to be amazed by the lengths that people will go to when they just can't seem to get over an ex. It makes no sense in any cases, but this one it is particularly bizarre. But before we get into it, I wanted to say a huge thank you to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video. If you've been watching my channel for a while, then you know that I absolutely love Harry's razors for their premium quality and their low prices. Harry's blades are made in their own factory in Germany, where they've been making blades for over a hundred years. They balance quality with affordability because they offer everything you need at a factory direct price. Nothing more, nothing less. They always offer a fair price to everybody, no pink tax or any other upcharges like other brands, while not skimping out on the quality. Trust me, Harry's razors deliver. I only use Harry's razors now because they're the only razors that give me that smooth, silky skin from a nice close shave without facing the consequences of razor burns and bumps like I do with other brands. Before when I shaved, I would have to do it a day or two before swimming or wearing shorts or whatever I was doing because I always had red inflamed skin for the first day or so but not anymore with Harry's. The great thing about Harry's is that they give you everything you need for a close, comfortable shave in a starter kit that comes at an amazing price. If you use my link down below at harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon, you can get your Harry's trial set for only $5. That is a $13 value, so make sure you use my link down below to get yours for only $5. Again, head to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon for this amazing deal. Thank you again so much to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic case of Amy Harwick. Amy Nicole Harwick was born on May 20th, 1981 and was adopted by Tom and Penny Harwick and she had a brother named Chad. Amy was raised in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, attending North Penn High School, graduating in 1999. She then took her dreams across the country, moving to Los Angeles, California by 2001. There, she completed her bachelor's degree at California Polytechnic State University, then went on to earn her Master's of Arts in Clinical Psychology at Pepperdine University but she wasn't done just yet. After earning her master's degree, she earned her doctorate of human sexuality from the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. She went on to work as a sex therapist who counseled clients who dealt with domestic violence as well as current or past sex workers. Amy was very passionate about her work. She did a lot of research, focusing on the various physical and psychological disorders, as well as trauma related to sexual exploitation and issues involving sexual identity and bipolar disorder. By 2014, Amy used her research in the field to publish her first book, The New Sex Bible for Women. With her being such a big name in this area of study, Amy went on to be invited to various TV shows and talk shows to talk as an expert in human sexuality. She was devoted to helping other women understand themselves. She also ran an online networking group for women, which helped other women in LA connect with each other and find job opportunities. She truly was a champion for women and advocated for positive changes. Beyond her passions at work and being a successful author, Amy had so many other interests. She loved horror movies and heavy metal music. She collected taxidermy with other objects in formaldehyde jars. She was known to be very quirky, as we can see from her unique interests. She loved photography and did some modeling as well. Her friends knew her as being strikingly beautiful, brilliant, and curious. She was a very independent, goal-driven woman with endless goals and aspirations. She was a genuine woman who was empathetic and caring, not just towards the patients she treated, but to everybody she knew in life. She was also very active and fit and had once worked as a personal trainer, publishing videos on different workouts. During college, she worked her way through by working as a bartender and doing go-go dancing, performing at nightclubs and parties all around the area. So in early 2010, Amy had been working a go-go dancing gig when she met a man named Gareth Pursehouse. He was six foot four tall, very wholesome, a pleasant looking man. He worked as an IT specialist and photographer, 
but his real passions were in comedy and acting. After meeting, Gareth and Amy started dating. According to friends, Gareth was different than the men that Amy would typically go for. He wasn't anything special, but that's kind of what Amy wanted at the time. Plus, Gareth was kind of obsessed with Amy, and she liked that at first, liking the feeling of someone needing her as much as Gareth seemed to. Her friend said that Amy saw him as a safe choice, someone who wouldn't cheat on her, somebody who isn't going to hurt her. But as their relationship started, friends noticed a shift. Amy stopped hanging around her friends as often, and her friends started to wonder if Gareth was the one preventing her from seeing them. Then it became obvious to friends that the situation was a lot worse than they originally thought. Gareth had become physically abusive. Amy put up with the abuse for a short time, documenting everything that he was doing to her, holding on to the hope that things would change. But finally, after a year and a half of dating, Amy broke up with Gareth. In June of 2011, Amy filed for a protective order against Gareth, claiming in court documents that he choked her, suffocated her, pushed her against the wall, kicked her, pushed her down, and hit her on multiple occasions. There were times that he would slam her against the floor or would slam her head against the floors or walls. Now, this first protective order was never actually granted due to Amy not following through with the petition. We don't know exactly why that happened, but by 2012, Amy did file for a restraining order. In this petition, she added another event. This time, she said that she had been driving with him in the car on the highway when he pushed her out of the moving car and left her there on the side of the highway by herself. And after each incident of abuse in a classic abuser fashion, Gareth would profusely apologize and beg for forgiveness. She also reported that Gareth broke into her apartment multiple times. The first of many incidents occurred in March of 2012, where Gareth broke in and smashed 10 picture frames against her door. Then she received a message from him warning that things will get worse. That following day, he left her a bundle of four dozen roses and taped them to the front door, again apologizing for his really terrible behavior. The day after that, he showed up again and stood outside of her apartment and played music for her. With all of these events documented, the restraining order was granted, but in California, restraining orders only last about five years before they need to be renewed. Over the course of those five years, though, Amy would continue to be harassed to a certain level. Friends say that Gareth would message them and bother them to ask them what Amy was doing. He would ask them to send pictures and videos of Amy. He wanted friends to send Amy links to love songs that he wanted her to hear, because, again, he couldn't be in contact with her, so he just contacted her friends and harassed them to try to get them to contact her for him. He became absolutely obsessed with her. During that same time, Amy kept getting hateful and derogatory online comments to her social medias and professional accounts. Things that were written in a way to try to make her look as bad as possible. Then, the friends continued to get messages with more hateful things written about her with the intent of trying to get her friends to hate her. Then, four years after the breakup, somebody actually broke into Amy's apartment and stole her photo albums and wiped all of the data off of her computer. Amy was confident that Gareth was behind it all. The hateful messages, these anonymous posts to social media and her professional websites, as well as the break-in. She didn't have any way to prove it, but she felt that he was still stalking her that many years after the breakup. Now, it was Amy's experience with Gareth that really encouraged her to pursue her career in counseling. This really drove her to use her experiences to get into a field where she could help others who have experienced sexual violence. Throughout her time in LA after breaking things off with Gareth, Amy had dated around a bit until she met the 61-year-old actor and comedian Drew Carey, who had also been the host of The Price is Right since 2007. The two met through a mutual friend who introduced the pair at a Hollywood party that the two attended. When they met once again, Drew was unlike any of the other men that Amy had dated. She thought that he was a genuinely nice guy, and by all accounts, the two had a great relationship. 
Within a year of dating, the couple were actually engaged. But by 2018, the couple called off the engagement, saying that it was an amicable split. Now, Drew would not initially comment on the reasons behind their split, but he did eventually give some insight into what happened. So apparently, Amy was not comfortable with the attention that she was getting from her relationship with Drew. Anytime the couple would go out in public, a headline would come out about them being together, and every time a headline would come out, Amy noticed that someone was online trying to ruin her reputation. So, as some of you may know, there are a bunch of different websites where you can review doctors and other medical professionals after a visit with them. Well, someone was going on these websites to say the most nasty, hateful, awful things about Amy. She really felt like if this kept happening, her reputation as a respected therapist would go down the toilet. There were times where Drew and Amy would fight about this. She would often say that she wishes Drew was not famous. She would say that whoever this person is trying to ruin her reputation wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for her relationship with such a big name in the Hollywood scene. The couple it did go to therapy to see if they could make things work, but ultimately, they had to break up. Drew said that the breakup was very painful to him, and after the split, they lost contact with one another. Of course, the thought here is that Gareth was becoming increasingly agitated with seeing Amy's public relationship being plastered all over newspapers and gossip websites. He was seething and jealous seeing how happy she was with somebody else. This wasn't just being jealous that she's probably in a relationship or seeing someone's Facebook posts of the couple. He was seeing these headlines and pictures everywhere. He could not escape it. So all he was seeing was her being happy with somebody else. That is what people are thinking with this entire situation. On January 17th, 2020, Amy was set to attend an adult business industry conference and award show, XBiz. She was invited kind of last minute after another member had canceled their spot. She was supposed to appear on a panel and speak about mental health and counseling for sex workers in the industry. However, little did she know, Gareth Pursehouse was also going to be in attendance, working as a photographer for the event. When Amy was about to walk the red carpet and up to the event, Gareth saw Amy and he had an outburst. According to others who attended, Gareth became extremely agitated and started yelling at Amy, saying, you're a hypocrite, you broke my heart, going on to say that she ruined his life and calling her a bitch. Witnesses describe how this six foot four tall man was wailing and crying and throwing a fit in public while working as a professional in this event with hundreds of people surrounding him. This was again in 2020, almost 10 years after Amy broke it off with him. So the fact that he was still that torn up about the breakup was very strange to say the least. After the outburst, Amy did what she did best. She remained calm and tried to de-escalate the situation. She grabbed Gareth, brought him to a more quiet area and sat him down on a bench with her and talked to him in a calm manner. The two spoke for 45 minutes. Onlookers to that conversation said that they could see Gareth flailing his arms in anger as Amy tried to talk him down. Others at the event would later say that she told Gareth that he needed to move on with his life in the best way she knew how without trying to be confrontational or making the situation worse. After a few minutes, things seemed to calm down and Amy went back to her group and went inside. As Amy and her associates sat at their table during the event, Gareth went over to Amy once again and asked her to talk again. Once again, they went back to that same spot that they were at before, and Amy did what she could to talk to Gareth in a calm, soothing way. After the event, Amy and her associates went out to dinner, and they said that Amy had been clearly shaken up about the entire thing. They talked about her getting pepper spray and changing the locks at her apartment. They also talked about possibly going to the police to report this. Her friend also offered to sleep at her place that night, but she declined, saying that she did have a roommate. She actually had a male roommate, so she felt safe with at least that other person there. In the weeks that followed, Amy's friend helped her change the locks, and she did get some pepper spray to defend herself. By February 12, 2020, Amy appeared to be having some feelings of either nostalgia or just missing her ex-fiancé for one reason or another. We aren't entirely sure what sparked this, 
but on the 12th, she texted Drew Carey to tell him that she would love to get together and talk with him about things. Of course, Drew was ecstatic to hear from her, so he responded that he would love to do that, and he said that he still loved her. From there, they agreed to meet up after Valentine's Day that weekend. The day of Valentine's Day in 2020 started as another normal day for Amy. In the early morning of that day, her and her friend went on a sunrise hike around the streets in Hollywood Hills. She was so excited to show her friend around the area, pointing out the different landmarks that she liked, and talking about the history of the neighborhood. Then she talked to her friend about the plans she had for that evening. She and a few friends were going to a burlesque show. At around 7 p.m. that February 14th, Amy left her home to go out and meet some friends for that burlesque show at the Globe Theater. She was wearing her rosary necklace, her leather jacket, with a velvet dress and boots. Meanwhile, her roommate Michael stayed at home and went to bed at around 9 p.m. that night. Around that same time, shortly after going to sleep, Amy's roommate woke up to what sounded like a dish breaking, but this didn't concern him too much because he figured that this was probably just Amy returning back home. He probably didn't check the time. I know that once I fell asleep and I wake back up, I have no idea how much time has passed, so he probably didn't check the time. He probably just woke up, heard her, thought she was coming in, and just went back to sleep. By 1.02 a.m., Amy pulled into the driveway of the apartment where she lived at and texted her friend, the one she had been at the burlesque show with, and asked her to send the pictures of them from that night. However, by 1.05 a.m., her roommate was awoken once again. This time, Michael heard what sounded like screaming until he heard a loud thud sound. Pretty much immediately, he realized that Amy was probably being attacked. So, he frantically got up and tried looking for his phone, but he couldn't find it right away. So, he tried yelling to the suspect to try and scare them away. Then, he ran out of the house, but he found himself in the courtyard, which was surrounded by a fence. So, he climbed over that metal fence, cutting himself in the process to get out and run over to a neighbor's house. I imagine when he woke up, he was probably just frantic and not thinking very clearly. Probably when he couldn't find his phone immediately, he was like, I'm not going to waste time and sit here searching for my phone, so I got to get out of here as soon as I can, but he probably didn't even think to grab keys. So, when he was outside, he probably was like, all right, I'm just going to hop the fence I'm not going to go back to get my keys. Who knows what's going on? I could be hurt by this perpetrator. I could make him even angrier. Who knows what can happen in this situation? So I imagine that's why he just got up and left the house because he was frantic and he wanted to get help as soon as possible. Either way, after running outside, he runs back and forth between different neighbors' houses, knocking on doors because no one was answering until 1.14 a.m. when he finally spotted someone walking down the street and asked them to use their phone. Finally, at that time, he called 911 for help. When police arrived to the scene, they first spoke with Michael, who was absolutely frantic. He expressed the severity of the situation to the police and told them that he heard screaming, a struggle, and then the sound of her falling. This was captured on the police body cam footage. 
not. Because she came home and listen, 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 sir. You need to relax a little bit so that we can get all the information, okay? Okay. okay. So how are we going to get? How are you planning on getting back in here? I don't know. I guess hopping the fence and getting my keys. Let me stop right there. I hopped the fence and I, I cut myself on that. I couldn't. I'm in the middle of sleep. I don't know how many people are in there. I don't know who's got a weapon or what. I'm trying to knock on neighbors' doors. Nobody's answering. I don't have a phone. I, I keep walking by. Right, I have a Take some deep breaths from here, right? Relax. Right. You don't have a lot of time. I mean, well, I mean, you're not going to get in there. You're not supposed to get in there. Well, sir, so how are we supposed to gain entry into this place? I guess hop the fence with me. We'll go around back. The back door's open. Let's go. So you're, where's your Kia? Inside, downstairs. The back door's open. So that, so you came out and came up this way? Yes. Hey, partner, we're going to have to jump it. We're trying to find a better place that we can jump it. How long ago did you last hear from her? We're going to have to go right here. Can you hold this? I find this footage to be a little bit frustrating. It kind of seems like police didn't really understand the gravity of the situation at first and weren't taking Michael super seriously in the beginning, but eventually they did kind of figure out that they needed to get inside no matter what, and they did. And when they did get inside of the property, they found 38-year-old Amy lying on the ground. She was lying beneath the balcony to her bedroom located 20 feet above. She was alive, but barely, and she was struggling to breathe. When they found her, it was obvious that she suffered from severe head trauma, but they also found injuries to her neck, which suggested that she had been strangled before she fell off the balcony. She was rushed to the Cedar sinai Medical Center, but a few hours after arriving by 3.26 a.m., Amy was pronounced dead at the hospital. Of course, police were very suspicious of Amy's sudden death right away. They didn't think that there was any reason that she just suddenly fell from the balcony for no reason. People that were out with her that night didn't say that she was intoxicated or under the influence of drugs or anything that would cause her to be so belligerent and unsteady that she just fell off her balcony. So, police pretty much immediately suspected that she had been murdered. So, when detectives started looking around Amy's home, they noticed that the glass to the French doors that led into Amy's home had been shattered. If you remember, at around 9 p.m. on the night of Amy's death, Michael, her roommate, woke up to the sound of breaking glass. It's thought that what he actually heard was the intruder breaking the glass to the French doors. Then, police found blood smear around the doors as well as a blood stain on the floor of the home. Of course, police swabbed this blood for DNA. Then, they found a trail of rosary beads from the rosary that Amy wore that same night. The beads led from her living room through the bedroom and onto the balcony. On that balcony, detectives found a syringe lying on the floor, and originally, they thought that it probably contained heroin, but even that didn't seem right. 
police had been told by Amy's friends again that she was not known to use drugs. She didn't even really smoke or drink that often. And again, she definitely was not that intoxicated that night. So they tested the substance inside and they found that it was filled with a lethal dose of nicotine. Um, and you're gonna be communications also, okay? Ready? This room, these two rooms are clear already. I hear voices, but I can't feel them. I got an open room, there's a, there's a balcony to the top. We got couches, looks like a kitchen to the right. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn right. Partner, you come with me. Hey, podcast, you cover this side, okay? You, you, cover, you cover straight ahead. Got it? I'm going. Hey, be advised, there's a, there's a lot of dummies. All right, let's clear this. Hey, uh, Cornel, come with us, dude. You guys, you guys hold that, okay? Or Pop County, you hold that. So you come with us, okay? All right. We got a doorway to the right that goes to the kitchen and to the left. So, um, we're gonna go right. Uh, Sweeney, you hold, you hold left, okay? All right. Kitchen. It loops around. It's gonna go down to the staircase. It goes out back outside. That is the same syringe that I observed. And is it in the, on this photograph, is it in the same location where you first observed it? Yes. Is that even more of a close -up? Yes, sir. And the way it looks here on C, the color of the liquid was not the color that you observed uh, that morning. Yes, sir. Then police found that one of Amy's neighbors actually had a ring doorbell camera that captured movement by Amy's house on the night of the murder. So the ring doorbell camera actually picked up someone tampering with it, trying to remove it from the neighbor's house or at least trying to cover it so it doesn't capture whatever this person was trying to do. This then triggered a notification to the owner's phone who was actually out of town that weekend. Then it showed a man walking near Amy's house before he flees the scene. Now, after Amy was pronounced dead at the hospital, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that there was evidence of wounds to her fingers and hands, which is consistent with defensive and assault type wounds, which suggested that she had been in an altercation. 
They also found DNA under her fingernails, most likely from her trying to scratch at and fight off her attacker. It also showed that she suffered severe injuries to her brain, liver, and pelvis, with her pelvis being completely shattered as the result of the fall. Then it was found that there were injuries to her neck, particularly a strap muscle hemorrhage, which is consistent with manual strangulation. But her actual cause of death was the result of blunt force trauma to her head that she suffered as a result of the fall. The medical examiner determined that Amy's manner of death was homicide. It was thought that Amy had been strangled and attacked before she was viciously shoved off of her balcony, falling 20 feet to her death. After finding the evidence at her apartment and it being very obvious that this was a murder, police took in friends of Amy's to interview them about who could have possibly wanted to harm Amy. And everybody that police spoke to all gave one name. Gareth Pursehouse. He was an ex of Amy's. There was documented abuse, and everybody around her knew that Gareth was obsessed with her. They told the police about the recent incident at the ex biz event where he had a public outburst after seeing Amy. It was clear to everybody who knew Amy that Gareth was still not over her, even eight years after the two split up. And I just want to pause for a moment to say that a grown man having a public outburst like that at a work event surrounded by so many people is somebody who clearly has some issues, obviously. Somebody who has a lot of things going on up here and who is not mentally stable and honestly, very immature. Someone who doesn't think about their actions before doing them. I don't know if he was fired. I would have if I had a photographer that was crying like a baby on the red carpet at an event, they would not have a job anymore. All this to outline that he was clearly very immature, mentally unstable, and somebody who had zero control over their emotions and let their emotions take over and absolutely had no control over their actions as a result of their emotions. So only about 13 hours after Amy's death on February 15th, 2020, police showed up to Gareth's house and arrested him and charged him with Amy's murder. When doing so, they took a look inside of Gareth's home and they actually found a syringe that matched the one that they found on Amy's balcony. When he was first arrested, his bail was set to $2 million and he did actually post bond and he was released. But he was rearrested two days later after a concerned friend called the police to report that they feared that Gareth was not going to stop killing. So he was arrested and taken in once again. This time he didn't get bail and he had to await his trial in jail. He did plead not guilty to the murder. So he went to trial, which started on August 29th, 2023. So literally less than a month and a half ago from the time that I'm recording this. The prosecution described how Gareth and Amy had dated back in 2011, but Gareth became abusive towards her. So she broke up with him and took out a restraining order against him. The two hadn't spoken in several years, but again, she still suffered harassment from an unknown assailant, but she always knew that it was Gareth. But then, after eight years, Gareth saw Amy again and had a freakout. He threw a very public fit in front of many witnesses, showing that not only was Gareth still not over Amy, but he had little to no control over his emotions, and it showed that he was very much obsessed with her and would do anything to get back together with her or to get back at her for breaking up with him. After that event, Gareth somehow found her phone number and started texting her. He asked her to start speaking more, and she said no. She said that they did not need to speak any further after they spoke at that event and declined any further interactions after that. But after being rejected, Gareth texted her and called her numerous times and left her a bunch of crying voicemails. This led Amy to blocking his number and then getting a new number and changing the locks like I mentioned earlier. She also got security cameras and started keeping more documentation of what she experienced. She actually wrote an email to herself, almost like a diary entry, to describe what happened and how she felt after seeing Gareth at the ex-biz event. 
She wrote, quote, I was scared and I felt like I needed to neutralize the situation. I didn't think he was going to attack me in that moment, but this clearly showed me how obsessed he was. He told me that he thinks about me every day and every day he cries. He told me he lost his job when we broke up because he couldn't work. He told me that no matter what, he couldn't stop obsessing over me. He told me I was a cheater and a liar because he thought we were still together when I believed we were broken up. He recited text messages that I had sent from this time frame about nine years ago. He recited the date, who they were to, and exactly what was said word for word. I couldn't believe it. I was very scared. So clearly, again, that outlines that he was still obsessed with her. He probably had those text messages ready to pull up anytime he did have a confrontation with her, hoping that someday he would see her again. And that clearly shows that he, again, was still very much obsessed with her. It kind of shows that he was the person behind the scenes doing all this to ruin her life because this showed that he was obsessed enough with her to go to these lengths. Then at the trial, the prosecution brought up forensic evidence. The blood DNA that was found on those broken French doors, that blood that was on the floor, and the DNA from under Amy's fingernails all matched Garrett. There was absolutely no way that this DNA could belong to anybody else. Then they talked about that syringe that they found at the scene that was filled with a lethal dose of nicotine. They argued that Gareth brought this to poison Amy. They said that you don't just get a nicotine syringe like that out of nowhere. You have to get it with the intent on using it to poison somewhere because again, it had a lethal dose in it. The prosecution stated, quote, that does not just happen out of nowhere. That does not land in his lap. He had to get that. He had to obtain that. It's a poison that if you inject it into someone, it may not be detected unless they're looking for it. Which is very scary, the fact that he chose this particular method of poisoning. He probably did know that it couldn't be detected unless you were looking for it. So again, if nothing else shows this, this just shows the lengths that this man went to to do whatever he was gonna do to ruin Amy's life or to end her life. So based on all of this, the prosecution argued that Gareth grabbed Amy inside of her home and started strangling her. But she screamed and he knew that she had a roommate. So instead of staying there to continue strangling her and risk being caught by the roommate, he dragged her upstairs to the third story balcony. As we can see again from that rosary that broke, the beads pretty much led to where she started being attacked, to where she was dragged upstairs to that third story balcony, and then he threw her over that edge to kill her. The prosecution talked about how he was 41 years old, six foot four inches tall, and 230 pounds, while Amy was 38, only five foot five, and 118 pounds. He clearly had the strength to easily overpower her enough to throw her over that ledge. They talked about how he tried tampering with that ring doorbell camera, trying to cover his face, but the camera later shows someone who looked just like Gareth with the same build as him leaving the scene of her home around the same time that she fell to her death. The defense, on the other hand, they argued that Gareth was depressed, that seeing her at that event caused him to spiral. He begged her for another chance, begged her to meet up again to talk about things. But after he was rejected once again, after all these times of being rejected, he was sent into a deep, debilitating depression that he could not overcome. So, he went to her home that night, but not to kill her. He never intended on killing her. He just wanted to talk to her. They said that he actually brought that lethal dose of nicotine to kill himself if she wouldn't take him back, not her. They said that the two started fighting, but Gareth didn't throw her over that balcony. Rather, she ran to the railing because she was afraid of him and then attempted to climb over it to get away from Gareth, but she was unsuccessful and fell to her death. He admitted that Gareth's actions led to her death, but he said that he did not murder her. This case reminds me a lot of the Warina Wright case that we discussed quite a long time ago of the, literally the same situation where Warina fell from the balcony, fell to her death, and they said that she tried climbing over it and that she just fell versus the person that she was with trying to push her over and killing her that way. In that case, he was actually acquitted and he was found not guilty of pushing her over the ledge. 
but this case is a little bit different from that one. The defense said that this breakup was something that he just could not get past, that he wasn't texting her and contacting her repeatedly to manipulate her, rather he is revealing his darkest secret to her, that he is still not over her. His depression may have caused him to make some poor decisions when he went over to her home that day to speak with her, but there's no proof that he pushed her over that ledge. So, after hearing the closing arguments from both sides on September 27th of this year, 2023, the jury went into their deliberations, and after deliberating, they came back with their verdict. They found that Gareth Purr's house was guilty of burglary, as well as the first-degree murder of his ex-girlfriend, Amy Harwick. All right, uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would read the verdicts onto the record, please. In the Superior Court of the State of California, County of Los Angeles, Department 107, case number BA 485380, people of the State of California versus Gareth Purse House. As to count one, we the jury the above entitled action finding defendant, Gareth Pursehouse, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree in violation of Penal Code Section 187, subsection A, a crime as charged in count one of the information. We further find the allegation that Gareth Pursehouse, Gareth Pursehouse intentionally killed Amy Harwick by means of lying in wait within the meaning of Penal Code Section 190.2, subsection A, subsection 15, to be true. Dated September 28, 2023, Juror number one, four person. As to count two, we the, above, we the jury in the above entitled action find the defendant, Gareth Purcell, guilty of the crime of burglary in the first degree in violation of Penal Code Section 459, a crime as charged in count two of the information. We further find the allegation that a person was present in the residence during the commission of the burglary to be true. Dated September 28, 2023, juror number one, four person. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are these your verdicts? So say you one, so say you all. Yes. Yes. Thank you. As of right now, we don't know the sentence as he is still awaiting his sentencing hearing, but right now he could be facing up to life in prison. When he is sentenced, I will make sure to let you all know as soon as I do. I will update the description box or come out with a community post, but either way, I will update you guys as soon as I know. But yeah, that is the information that we have on today's case. This is truly a wild case to me. The fact that so much time had passed without having any contact and he was still that obsessed with her is just scary. The fact that someone can be so obsessed with one person for that long is scary for anybody who's had a rough breakup. And the fact that literally so many years passed and he still chose to throw his life away for a woman that he went eight years without seeing is just wild to me. Obviously, this is such a heartbreaking case. It seems like Amy brought so much good to the world. She was such an inspiring woman with so many goals and aspirations in life. She could have helped so many more people with their issues, and the fact that she is gone is just devastating. My heart goes out to her family, friends, her clients, and everybody else who loved her. But that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. What do you think could cause someone to snap the way that Gareth did so many years later? Do you think that he ever moved on or do you think that seeing her sparked something in him? Do you think he was the one responsible for all of that, you know, behind the screen harassment for so many years? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok accounts. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy and I hope to see you next time. Bye.